No, I've written about 100 free plugins. I do it because I, I enjoy writing code. Um, and most of them aren't things I would even want to deal with the effort of selling. But his question was, um, in a general sense, you know, in his own website, he's got you know, the firewall plugin, a limit logins, things like that. And is there anything he's missing, or is, it, is that covering it? First off, your host should be making sure the underlying server is up to date, because that's most of those big vulnerabilities that have been in the news have all been at that level. Like Heartbleed and then the Spectrum and, and whatever the Spectre and something else, Meltdown. Um, those are all server level things, which again, I'm not a sysadmin. I'm not even pretending to know how that works. Um, but those are things that you running a site couldn't really do anything about anyway. That's at the server level. The plugins, if you're working with a managed host, they're going to take care of that for you. And yeah, but not in the updates, but usually they will have those security tools embedded in the site to where you're not even doing anything and they're just handling it. And most of the hosts, they all have a different way they do it. There's not one right, wrong, this, that, and the other. Um, but more importantly, it's, yeah, it's keeping your stuff up to date. It's keeping an eye on it. Sometimes just visually looking at your site again, both in the front and back end, you're going to find where those things happen. Be it a security thing or be it just like maybe there was an update and it changed a div tag and now something's you know, off to the side. I run into the habit of I forget to actually look at what I build. Like I'll build something and I'll look at it and everything works and I'll forget about it. So just kind of almost trying to look at your site as a regular viewer again, you can kind of catch some of those things that maybe you wouldn't see or you can run into, you know, if you're logged in, you're going to get different stuff that shows up. So try it logged out on a different browser just to see what's happening for your average user. And from there, you'll, you, know, you should find any other little cracks. But again, if you're running firewall and logins and on a good host, there's not much else. Yeah, that seems, I mean, because a lot of times I see people get locked out and then I have to go in and unlock it. And there's like someone, and then when I look at the log file, it's amazing how many people are attempting to. Do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, th those things are all automated. Like, and again, like, this isn't a, isn't a security thing. There's people that, that know way a lot more about that than I do. Um, but most of that stuff's automated anyway. Um, they're just looking for vulnerable, you know, people are just looking for vulnerabilities on sites. So, yeah, it's just a matter of keeping an eye on things and keeping things up to date. Um, three security plugins is not better than one. Uh, just like three SEO plugins isn't better than one. Uh, usually it's just going to contradict itself and they won't work. So, yeah, if you've got it working and you've got a minimal, they're not creating big you know, uh, performance issues because that's the biggest thing you run into with security plugins or performance issues because they're doing so much work that they can slow down the site if they're not built properly. So that's why I'm saying go look at it like a regular person because you might notice things are running differently because you're not logged in. So who else has a question? On the same line, do you have a personal checklist when you have a site for the security? Um, no, I put them on hosts that do that for me. Um, and, and the reason being is you know there used to be, and it was, um, I don't even remember which plugin I used to use. I think they may have changed names. But I try to go as minimal on that end as possible because I don't really fully know how some of those things work in the sense like I've not audited uh, WordFence or any of those big security plugins because they do so many things. Uh, in general, when I look for plugins, be it for security or any other reason, I try to find plugins, if I, didn't, if I haven't already built it, um, is it does one thing. It does the one thing I want it to do and only the one thing I want it to do because the chances of it interacting with other plugins wrong reduces greatly. The chance of it breaking in general with changes to WordPress go away. Like I've got plugins that I wrote five years ago that work just fine. I've not updated a single line of code because they do one thing and that one thing hasn't changed in core. So, you know, I, I tend to, like the number of plugins is irrelevant. One bad plugin is worse than 100 well written ones. And for, you know, again, like the security stuff, like a lot of that is, is you hear about it all the time. So it seems like it's a huge deal. But for most site owners, as long as they've done the initial stuff at the beginning, there's not, you know, like you wouldn't, neither of us would be able to actually recognize a security attack if it were happening, you know, in real time. But the people on the hosting level do. So that's why, you know, especially with a lot of the managed hosts now, they're doing that because that's like, 
that's a full-time job for somebody is to monitor security threats and make sure those weird you know libraries nestled into the bottom of Linux are updated. Like that's a full-time job, and that's why hosts had pay those people. Um, so I let them do it. You know, it's, I try to focus on what I'm good at, and then let professionals do the things that I'm not, and doing things like under you know like securing a server and, and all that. But from a list of plugins, like yeah, limit login attempts, that one's always good just because that stops a lot of the just the throttling hits on your WP login. I don't really run anything else other than that. But I'm always I'm inside of my site every all my sites ten times a day. So if anything, we're, and most of them are on hosts that I have access to, so I can see everything happening, which is not everybody. So, but again, same thing with him. Just keep an eye on it. Um, you know, visually looking at it will will do a lot more because you know what it's supposed to look like because it's your site. So if anything's out of place, you're going to know before anybody else because you know where it's supposed to be. Um, and a lot of times, that you know, if you see just one thing off that wasn't off before, that's usually a sign that other things have been changed and may not be the way that you wanted it. So, and the only other thing I would do is if you're running any of those security plugins, which again, most of them are fine, uh, don't just go check every box. Um, like, who here you, uh, used W3 cache? I won't say continues to use because you shouldn't. Um, but the, it used to be you could check all these boxes. But there was really nothing about it that said what they did. And it let you turn on two different types of caching at the same time that were completely against each other. Like you couldn't, you can't use both object caching and, and the database caching the way they had it set up. But it let you pick both of them. So all it would do was make your site slower. And it wouldn't even like prompt you saying, hey, you've turned this thing on. Um, so a lot of times when you get all these settings in a plugin, you're like, oh yeah, that, that looks good. Yeah, I totally want page guy. I want this, I want that. Um, but you may not. And so look at the, you know, look at what the plugin is trying to do. Make sure you go through all, any plugin you ever install. Go to the settings page, make sure every single setting is what you do or don't want. Because a lot of times, you know, everything that I've built, usually I have it load a set of default values at install. So that way, if you don't go to the settings page, it works. And you know, it's not finding like index values that are missing or things like that. So uh, just be mindful of what you're using. And periodically, especially with those bigger plugins, go back to the settings. Like, how many people here have had to update their Facebook privacy settings at least five times? That'd be everybody. Because <clears throat> they keep adding new things that they opt you in or out of automatically. Uh, same thing with some of those big plugins. Like they add features, they add, uh, you know, they change the way certain you know, existing features work. So kind of periodically just pop back in and look like, all right, is it still configured the way that I want it to be configured? Is there a notice telling me I need to go authorize something or, you know, connect something to something else? Like especially with like analytics and stuff, sometimes if like Google, Google's notorious for changing their APIs and never telling anybody about it until they do it. Uh, so there was a point, I think it was like a year or two ago, where essentially I had to go back and reauthorize every single Google Analytics account in every site that I managed because Google had changed how the connection between the site and they worked. Um, if I hadn't have looked in those settings, I would have just all of a sudden be like, why are my analytics wrong? Nothing prompted me to say, hey, Google changed something, you should do this. I just happened to go look, and that's why I saw it. So like, periodically go through and just kind of look at the settings again, make sure that it's still doing what you want, that it's still there, that you haven't forgotten about it and realized like, you don't need it anymore. Like, you can probably go get rid of most of the social, sh uh, social sharing plugins that you have on your site. Um, like, LinkedIn got rid of the share count and nobody noticed. If you go look at them, they don't give share count anymore. Nobody, nobody even noticed. I mean, it's LinkedIn, but still. Um, so, you know, those kind of things. Like, just kind of keep an eye on what you're running, and you'll you'll see stuff that you can get rid of. You can see stuff that you can change. It may be like, okay, this plugin does nine things, and you only want one. Find a plugin that just does the one. It's going to be lighter. It's going to be easier to use. It's not going to get in your way, uh, and it's just going to run into a lot of you know, a lot less issue, you know, chance of issues because of it. I'm just hearing about Gutenberg for the first time this weekend, and uh, Congratulations. I just want to hear your take on it, but it looks like it's pitched at novice users. So, I mean, there's talks, I mean, I think there's a track on Gutenberg, uh, and it's been evolving so much that 
depending on when you like you seeing it for the first time is probably better than most of us here because we've watched it evolve and change so much that I'm not even sure. Like I have screenshots that I know that I've looked at and I don't even know if they're valid anymore, um, which is fine because this is the development phase where that stuff should be changing. Uh, some people look at Gutenberg as a page builder. Some people look at it as like a whole new UI. Some people kind of look at it in between. And I think the, for most things that I've seen, uh, once it's actually done, well, and I say done as in release, it'll always be iterated on, you're going to start to see how people use it. And that, I think, will dictate a lot of the further development on it and where it goes. Yeah, it's a totally different UI. Uh, for long-time WordPress users, it's going to be incredibly jarring. Uh, it's going to seem wrong at first, uh, just because it's such a departure from, from what we're used to. Uh, I'll say in the beginning of it, I was in no way, I thought it was a waste of time in the very beginning. Uh, I was like, there's nothing wrong with the editor we have. We have plenty of other things we can work on. That's not how open source works. Uh, furthermore, the people that were working on Gutenberg, it's not like they didn't work on some other thing that I think is more important. Um, they wanted to work on that, so they did. Uh, I think it's going to be a long-term good change because the editor that we have now is like, is like 10 years old. Like, I don't use any other software that's 10 years old other than that and maybe some banking software that they haven't updated. So, you know, as much as I wish certain things didn't change because I'm comfortable with it, if that, you know, if the current experience, I feel, if it doesn't evolve with the rest of the web, I don't think, WordPress won't go away, but it won't be what people want it to be anymore. And you'll start to see that sort of drop off where like, yeah, okay, yeah, it's WordPress, but it'd be really cool if I could do this. And then they end up going to places like Medium or whatever other platforms there are out there. So most people don't use editors like we do. So for most people, I think, again, once it's done and it's solid enough that like, things aren't going to drastically change uh, from appearance and functionality wise, I think it'll be a long-term good thing. Uh, it's going to be rough. Like, I think it's going to be a rough transition for a lot of people, both from the people that have had a site and maybe have a developer that they call every now and then if they have a problem. All of a sudden, everything's going to look really different one day. Um, I'm sure that I will get contacted from old clients saying that their sites are broken. Um, and I'll deal with it. But yeah, I think it's going to be a little bit of a rough transition. But I think when it's done, that actual transition part, I think it's going to be worth it. Because some of the things that people are building off of that are things that would take me, like some of those blocks that people, you see people mentioning that, oh, I bet do it to do this, do it to do that. Like it used to take me days to develop the functionality so users could do that stuff. Whereas now it'll be a button that they hit and they're like, yeah, there's my picture, there's my map. There's my call to action. Like all of those things that you can do with blocks used to be all custom code, which meant no two sites ever did it the same. Heck, no two sites that I built did it the same. Uh, and that, you know, that now in turn becomes something that I have to manage and keep up on and could break, whereas the Gutenberg stuff should be, again, once they've kind of nailed it down, should allow being able to introduce new features to things that would show up in the content. Because really what Gutenberg is, is it's redefining what we think is content. For most of us, content's the words in the middle. And then we have a sidebar and some other, you know, this, that, and the other. Now it's the whole page is really the content. Depending on how you build your site and what you're trying to say, it could be any number of things. But yeah, maybe you got a map, maybe you got these things. You know, all of those things can be built into Gutenberg so the user just thinks everything works together. Along those lines, so, and I also read that um, Initially, it was being developed with uh, kind of a React template uh, in mind, and now they're creating their own library for that. I don't know which one they've decided. There's probably somebody here that would know better. Initially, there were some questions in licensing with React because of Facebook. Uh, they had a weird license on it that said that it was open source, but we can still do whatever we want and change. Like it was a very odd license. And again, I'm not even an attorney, but it looked weird to me. Um, <clears throat> they blinked. Facebook changed the license which is why we can use it without any risk of them pulling something. Uh, a lot of the stuff built, so it's, there's still a lot of React in there, but the, yeah, a lot of the stuff we're building on top of it for WordPress is being built you know, to match WordPress. So yeah, it's still written in React, uh, which I know very little. I've tried, I still can't wrap my head around the idea of throwing CSS and JavaScript, I mean CSS and HTML inside of JavaScript files. It just seems wrong, I know, um, but the, I mean, that, that React's not going anywhere. 
like I'm learning it because it finally I'm like, all right, yeah, this isn't a fad. This isn't going to be gone in a year. This isn't going to be Angular 1 or whatever it was. Um, or other languages or libraries that were huge and now nobody talks about. So, I mean, it's worth learning, obviously. But I think, for, again, for the end user, they're not going to have any, you know, they're not going to know React. You know, like your average Facebook user doesn't know that they're using React. They know that they're using Facebook. Um, it's going to be the same idea. Like, they're not going to be aware. They don't have to. They're users. That's why we do what we do, is so they can just use it. <laughs> so I think, again, like once it's polished and they kind of work through some of the things, like meta boxes are still a thing that they're working through some of the edge cases on, uh, making sure plugins that already exist work with it. Like, I know I'm going to have a, probably going to have to take a week or two and kind of run through some of my bigger plugins and make sure everything's still showing up where it should. But, you know, otherwise, yeah, it's, I mean, it, again, I think next, I say maybe like two, three years from now, the conversation will be like, what else can we do with Gutenberg? Not, why do we need it? Like, I think that's going to happen. Are you aware of any blocks that uh, others have developed and made available for download to play with? With uh, Gutenberg? Yeah. Uh, he's asking, uh, is there anything that uh, available out there that lets you just kind of play with it? Uh, first off, yeah, you can download the plugin automatically right now if you wanted to. Uh, there's also uh, Tom, what's his last name? Begins with an N. I can't remember, but he built a essentially a front end testing for Gutenberg that you can just go and mess with without logging in, without downloading anything. Um, and I can't remember the name of the site right now. I'll, I'll, Frontenberg. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Andrew. Um, so that'll let you go in and play with it now. And as, it get, as the updates are done and the development's being worked on, that gets updated so you can see changes as well. Um, and that's actually a great first way, if you haven't really messed with it, is go to that site because you don't have to do anything other than mess with it. You don't have to install anything, you don't have to configure anything, you just go. So I would, def I would go that route and just kind of, again, get familiar with it. Like I wouldn't get too worried about like, the minor details of where buttons are or fonts and color. You know, like all that's going to be ironed out. Um, I would just kind of get used to the feel of where and how things move and get put together. I have two questions, actually. Okay. Do you have a recommended number of plugins, like a maximum amount? Nope. Um, the reason being is I use WordPress a few years back for the business of mine. I went crazy with it. I installed like 30 plugins. So that impacted the, you know, the loading speed. I ended up outsourcing some developer from like another country to kind of go in, tweak, I don't know what he was doing exactly, and he optimized the site despite the fact that I have an overabundance of plugins. Okay. First one, and we'll get to your second one after. Uh, his question was, is there like a number of plugins that is the right number? And the answer is no. There is not a number. There is not a minimum or a maximum. I've had sites running two plugins. I've had sites running 78 plugins. Um, the site that was running 78 plugins had a page load time of 1.1 second. It's not the number, it's how well they're written. And that's why, again, like I said earlier, like looking for plugins that do one thing, it's very easy to write clean, concise code to do one thing. The moment you start adding other functionality to that plugin, it becomes muddled because now you have to check for things. Like the first big plugin I ever wrote was for FAQs. And it was like right when custom post types came out and um, I think it was like, I don't know, there's like 50,000 or 100,000 people using it. And I wrote it six years ago, so the code isn't great, um, but people would ask for, it was the first one that ever got any traction, and people would ask for these, you know, this feature, and I'm like, yeah, absolutely, you know, just code all this stuff in, because I was all excited about it, and now I have to support a plugin with all these features that maybe 1% of people use. Uh, I actually have a huge update to it that I haven't pushed, because I'm afraid I'm going to break people's sites. So, the, you know, the, again, the number, no, I just look at what you're running, and look if you're actually using what you've installed. Because again, like if it does nine things and you're using one, there's probably a plugin that just does the one. Um, and most of the plugin, heck, a bunch of ones that I've built uh, will do the conversion of stuff from other plugins. Uh, I built one that does, uh, somebody wrote a blog post once called Minimum Viable Meta Tags. And it was like the bare number of tags you had to have so that like Facebook and Twitter and all that would like pick up the title and the picture and all that. So I made a plugin that did that because it's it, the smallest possible it can be. And I had it where it'll convert from Yoast and all-in-one and all that. Uh, 
so things like that. Yeah, I wasn't using any of the other SEO tools in the SEO plugin. I literally just wanted meta tags. So I just installed something that did meta tags and I didn't even bother with the rest of SEO because I didn't, it's, it was from my own side, I could care less about SEO. So I'll never beat Norcross Georgia in Google. I've learned. So it's not even worth it for me. But yeah, I find it doing the one thing I want and then you can end up stacking on top of that and it doesn't become as much of an issue because not only is it only doing the one thing, it's not touching other plugins. It's kind of siloing itself. And you'll, yeah, one bad plugin can totally ruin your performance. Like if anyone's using broken link checker, turn it off. Like as soon as we're done. Because that plugin is throttling and trashing your site more than you could possibly imagine. Because it's constantly checking every single piece of content you have with multiple regex passes to try to find a link that doesn't work. Turn it on when you want to use it and check and turn it right back off. Like certain hosts won't even let you keep that plugin on anymore because that's how non-performant it is. So things like that, just keep an eye on what's running. There's some tools you can actually do performance testing with, uh, both online and, and some plugins like the uh, uh, which is Query Monitor, which is a plugin that I use on when I'm developing stuff. That'll in the toolbar it'll give you load time and how many hooks are running. You can find duplicate queries that way. Um, it's all a query monitor. Um, John Blackburn wrote it. It's a great plugin. Um, and then another thing that's also fun is, is I wrote a plugin called Airplane Mode, which does exactly what it sounds like. It turns off any external call. And I built it because I was on a plane home from Portland, and it kept trying to load the Google font that used to be in the admin, which would then error out every 30 seconds because I was on a plane with no Wi-Fi, and I couldn't turn it off. So I was pissed off on an, on an airplane, so I wrote a plugin. And now it's... It's huge, but um, by activating that, I can, if I turn that back on, I can see the performance difference. I can start looking, okay, what external calls are slowing down my site? You know, if you have like, for example, remember that little Facebook, like here's all my friends that you'd put in your sidebar? Every single photo of someone was making a separate HTTP call, also then a call for your information, and then, so depending on how many little squares of people you had, it could be making anywhere from 15 to 35 HTTP calls for a stupid little sidebar widget that nobody cared about. Um, so things like that, where like look at, you know, try to look at the individual pieces that are running, and that's where you'll probably find what's wrong. And then, yeah, second question. Yeah, I mean, most of my stuff I'll put in GitHub. Um, and there's, I know s just enough about Git to where it works. But if it breaks, I have to Google or ask somebody. And, but I'll keep it in there. Um, I try to push them, you know, I, I push stuff either public and GitHub. Some stuff I don't put in the repo because it's like developer focused or just something that regular users don't need. And it's in GitHub, so like a developer knows how to find it. I'm not going to get support questions from a developer the same way that I would with a user. So like, um, I used to use uh, WAMP and then MAMP, uh, and now I run Vagrant, uh, VVV, which there's local, they're here, uh, there's desktop, there's a handful of ones, so find the one that you're comfortable with. Um, because some of them like allow you to change PHP versions really fast, so like if you're working on different stuff, you might need to test you know, 5.4, then 5.6, then 7. I don't, because I'm putting stuff on a host that I know is going to be one version. Um, and usually, again, I just kind of keep stuff lean on my own computers. But if you have a local environment that you're comfortable with, use it. If you have an editor that you're comfortable with, use it. Like, I don't use a full IDE. I hate them. I personally, they're just way too complicated, and they get in the way of me doing my job. Other people could not do their job without them, and that's fine. Um, it's more important to use what you're comfortable with than trying to use what people say, this is the right thing. Um, because of it, all it'll do is make you slower. So I'll use Grunt, um, I, I use Grunt because that was the first one I learned. And I don't know, I don't use any of those enough to bother having to relearn the whatever, I think there's gulp and I don't even know what there are anymore. Um, but 
I don't really have a boilerplate so much as, like there's certain stuff like I'll just go and grab from stuff that I've written because I've saved almost every bit of code I've ever written. And so I'll remember, oh, okay, I wrote that functionality for that one site. I'll go take it, kind of pull it out, and then look at it, clean it up, try to general purpose it. A lot of times, now mind you, I don't, um, I work for, I never introduced myself. Uh, I'm Andrew Norcross, I work for uh, Liquid Web. I used to run Reactive Studios as a uh, uh, client service and product company. Uh, so a lot of times there'd be things where we'd be working on a larger client project and certain functionality, like this is useful. And we would write that separately, write it as a plugin, and put it on their site. But then we can now use that, you know, across, you know, it'd be like once, you know, once is an edge case, twice is starting, and then three times is you better get used to it. So, uh, and that, you know, that's where I'll do with that. And I'll just kind of piece together what I need as I'm doing it. Uh, I think there's a big difference between developers that were self taught and ones that actually had a structured uh, education. Because there's a lot of things I do that I don't know. I just do that because that's what I've always done. And I still, to this day, I've been doing this for almost 12 years now. I get corrected by people that have been doing this much less than I have. And they're absolutely right. It's like I'm used to doing things the way that I do them. And sometimes I don't pay attention to the fact that other things change. Um, that's, again, like the whole thing with WordPress backwards compatibility means I don't necessarily have to get better as a developer for a while. Uh, I don't recommend doing that, but you can get away with it. Um, in the sense that like something's not gonna break every three months because we're doing these huge overhauls. Uh, so you know, after that, not really. I mean, I just kinda, most of the projects that we would do uh, were so one-off and unique that there'd be a little bit of stuff that I could share between, but the scope was such that I, we couldn't really wholesale reuse stuff. So. Yeah, you know, I use yeah, you know, I use Grunt, um, SAS. Again, that was the one that made sense to me because it still had brackets. Um, the I've used Composer and stuff that already had Composer. I don't myself set up Composer for that stuff just because usually in my head it's overkill. Um, but if you're building something that's going to get released publicly, uh, it's probably worth looking at you know pulling in the test you know the. Uh, unit testing suite and all that stuff you can do with Composer. Um, I know there are other ones, but Composer is the only one that I've seen enough people using that I know I can ask somebody when I don't understand it. In regards to performance, you're talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, he was asking if you want to do your own performance testing. Uh, the easiest way is if you can't, usually you can't do it on a production site because it's live and people are doing things on it. So the host that you're on should provide you with the ability to spin up a staging site that is mirrored of your live site in the same, importantly, the same environment. So it's got the same caching, it's got the same PHP versions, the same, all the things. and then, because you can destroy a, you can just thrash a staging site to figure something out and just delete it and move on. So, I mentioned the uh, query monitor will show you a lot of the query times. That's the first thing I look at. Is I will look at individual pages on the site that I know are important, like the home page. If there's a contact page, uh, if there's any galleries or any, especially e-commerce, if there's any checkouts and all that, I'll actually just walk through like I'm a normal person, and I'll in the it shows up in the admin bar. It'll show you the query time. So you can start to see, okay, there's 19 queries on this page. Why? Now, they may be valid. Um, but by doing that, you can start to dig down and see, okay, what's happening page to page. Your biggest performance hit is going to be um, advertising. Like, I get that the internet runs on ads, but I absolutely hate advertising. Uh, because they slow down sites to the point where, like I've had, I remember once I actually, I was so upset with a client because they, they kept saying that you're making my site slow. And I was like, no, all these ad networks are making your site slow. And I bet him, I mean, I, we fired the client afterwards, he was kind of an asshole, but um, I bet him. I'm like, I will bet you a dollar that everything that you're complaining about is your ad networks. And so I made a copy of the site and I made it identical except for removing the ads, and it dropped nine seconds off their load time. 
I won my dollar. And you know, so sometimes it's like, yeah, you got to dig through, just start. You know, it, it seems very rudimentary, but yeah, uh, you know, deactivate, turn it back on. See, one of the biggest things, people write plugins that are only intended to work in the admin and still load their assets on the front end. That's going to be a performance set because you're loading CSS and possibly JavaScript files that you're never going to use on the front because it's only for an admin. And furthermore, it should only be on one page in the admin for whatever that plugin is, but instead they load it everywhere. Um, so like in Query Monitor, you can see every action that gets fired. So the save posts, the, you know, whatever it is, like all of the ones that get, all the hooks that get uh, fired on the front end, it will show you every single one. So you can start to see, wait, why is the admin, ex you know, say a plugin's made for the admin, why is this loading here on every page? Like why is the CSS for a settings page in the admin loading on the front end? Um, and that's just usually just a careless developer. And you start to look for those things and just kind of drill down to like what's the bare minimum of the site to work and then use that as your baseline. Because sometimes it's a host. Sometimes just the host sucks. Um, sometimes it's, the, it's one plugin. You know, we've, I've had plenty of sites where there's literally one plugin that is creating every single problem on the site. Get rid of the one plugin and your problem solved. So just kind of work backwards with what's there. Um, sometimes we'll, like, I'll switch out a theme. I'm like, OK, is this the theme code that's the problem? But again, if you do it all on a staging site, you're not going to mess with production, and you're not going to upset anybody that's happened to visit your site. Uh, so yeah, I've got at least, for any site that I have to manage, I have at least one local, a staging, a test, and production. So like, I'll build it local, I'll throw it on staging to make sure nothing blows up immediately. Um, then I'll push it to test to make sure that it's working with everything else, and then the client or whoever, the stakeholders can go look at it, and then I'll push it to production. So. I do all my stuff at the staging and local. So by the time it gets to anybody else looking at it, the performance stuff's been looked at. Or you can say, oh, OK, as soon as I went from staging to test, my performance dropped. What's different? Because there's, usually there's something different. So it's you know, turning on logging. It's turning on sometimes going into the hosting panel, depending on what the panel is, and looking. Am I running the right versions of things? Like, Am I still running an old version of PHP because I just forgot? <laughs> Um, like I found a site the other day that I had on 5.2, I know, um, because I hadn't looked at it in four years, and that was the default when it was installed, and I just never bothered to look. Um, so I switched to 7, and lo and behold, the site is a lot faster. So especially, yeah, if anything you can upgrade to PHP 7 and above, do it. That's going to give you an immediate performance boost right off the bat, assuming that none of your code is written in such a way that it'll error. So like, spin up a staging, change the PHP version, make sure everything still works. Um, turn on the logging so that if there are like those silent errors that don't actually you know like white screen it, but there's still like a missing index or you know this one you know a setting isn't there. Like I mentioned earlier about going to the settings page, sometimes if they don't set settings, but the plugin will still look for them, it'll error quietly because it's looking for a value that doesn't exist, an in or a, a variable. Um, so look for those kind of things. Like turn on the WP debug, and I usually I will turn on w, uh, WP debug on, debug logging on, display off. So that way I can still actually look at what I'm working on. But it'll spit out, and especially if you're using uh, Query Monitor, it'll show up in red in that bar that here four errors, one warning. And then you can kind of dig through and figure out what's wrong and work backwards from there, and that should take care of most of it. I'm going to ask him, and then you. What's your uh, workflow for uh, deployment of theme plugins into the uh, Some of it will be influenced by whatever the client already has. So for some of them, they already had their own versioning set up and their own servers, especially when we would start working with more enterprise-level clients. They had infrastructure. So I would I try to be as flexible as possible with my own workflow. And because I'm usually working with somebody else, and the chance of them having the exact same workflow as I do is not going to happen. So I try to be as flexible as possible. Like I use Sublime Text. It's comfortable for me. Um, I use Git, whether it's in GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket, you know, whatever one it's in, um, I push there. I try to branch properly, but sometimes I don't realize that I'm like working on two small features at the same time, and it's in the same branch. I won't go back to try to recreate 
all that branching and stuff. I'll just push it live. Um, as far as the actual deployment, again, it really depends on what access I have. Uh, sometimes it'll be something like DeployBot or some of the webhooks in GitHub that'll automatically push it. Sometimes I open up and SFTP some sites. Uh, some are S, uh, SSH'd, and it really, yeah, it really, what access I have, because, again, like I, as I learned all this stuff, growing, you know, when I was younger, I used whatever tool was available, and I could figure it out first. So some of the, I'm sure that some of my workflow is probably not as optimized as it can be, but because I know it so well, it's quicker than me switching to something else. Uh, and then, you know, as far as the actual deployment. I, at that point, it almost really doesn't matter. It's whatever way I can get it to the server as quick as possible. Um, I just make sure I decouple my versioning from my hosting. I don't do version control where I host the site. Because if the host goes down, now my version control is gone. And I can't get my stuff anymore. Uh, so I try to keep at least, one thing that's great, Bitbucket gives you unlimited fr uh, free unlimited private repositories. So I have a Bitbucket account that is just literally a backup of everything I've done. And it just, when I'm done, I push one version of it there and I leave it alone. And in the event that I need to go back and get something or something disappears, I have one copy for myself. And all of them have ways to deploy. And once it's, you know, it really ends up being like, what, how quickly can I do it? And where does it need to go? Do I need to push it to three different places at once? Then it's okay, I'm gonna do something different. Do I just need to basically upload a config file? Like I might just open up my FTP client because I don't wanna go through nine steps to move one file. So yeah, I try to just basically is how quickly can I get this done to move on to whatever else I wanna do. What about the database? So I use the, I'll use mostly CLI stuff for that because the database contains so many serialized values that if you're trying, if you need to change anything in it, and usually there's like a test domain that goes to a production domain. Uh, now that uh, Google and now, uh, Chrome and now Firefox both don't let you load .dev without an HT, without a certificate. Um, now all my dona domains have .test, which means it's this different number of letters, which means that every single serialized value has to be adjusted to make sure that the index number is reflective of the new value that it contains or it breaks. So, um, I'll use the WPCLI for pretty much all of that. Uh, there's also a it's search and replace DB. It's a tool that the Interconnect guys over in the UK built. It's incredibly powerful for database stuff, for doing search replace, for updating whole you know all the tables at once kind of thing. I I end up using that if I need something more than CLI or if I don't have CLI access. Um, otherwise, it's some, again, some hosts will give me uh, PHP My Admin, which again is probably the worst tool to use, but it works. Um, some of them will give you in their own panel a way to, to export the database. Uh, where it runs into issues is where I'm making changes to live sites that already exist. And usually that it just involves coordinating with the client. Like what's gonna change in these two weeks? Is it gonna be new posts? Is it orders? Like on an e-commerce site, I don't touch the database unless I absolutely have to because I don't wanna trigger something that messes up historical data. Whereas if it's a blog post, I can recreate a blog post. Like I don't want to recreate six months worth of transactional orders. So it's wherever you can push it and yeah, I try to keep, again, I always keep, whenever I'm gonna change the database, I pull it out, I save a copy and then I edit it and I leave one copy untouched. So in the event that I've made a mistake, which has happened, uh, I just immediately push back the original and then take a step back like, all right, what did I mess up? What do I need to fix? And then again, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of plugins and tools that'll do it, uh, but usually they, the tools don't, other than the CLI and stuff, they don't show you what it's doing. It just spits out a file when it's done, and that worries me um, because I don't know how it's creating that database file, and I don't know what it's doing to it. So a lot of times on those ones, I want to use like the rawest tool possible that will do the littlest to my site, other than give me what I want. Yeah, yeah, WPCLI, sorry. Um, and again, most of your hosts should now make that available to you if they haven't already. If they don't, you may want to look at why. And that may, that may be a sign of other things about the host that maybe aren't up to speed. Um, 
but yeah, the CLI, WPCLI for moving databases is my preferred way because it seems to, it's the least likely to mess something else up. Core. I mean, I learned WordPress by reading core files. Because there were no sites, there were no schools, there were no, there may be a tutorial or a forum here and there, but I learned it by reading core. I'd see what happened, I'd break it on purpose, and try to fix it. I did that with QBasic when I was eight years old, and I do it with PHP and JavaScript now. Um, so, in terms of things to look at, I start with what am I trying to accomplish? Because there's a lot of very well-written plugins that have, z I don't know what they're doing because I'm not trying to solve that problem. So I don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Because you can make code look really pretty and it can be garbage. And vice versa. There's some code that I've seen that is some of the most brilliant stuff I've ever written and it looks like someone threw up numbers on a page. So, and there are formatters in most of the IDEs and editors where you can hit a button and it'll look pretty again. So that isn't necessarily what I look for, is I try to drill down and I'll look at, a good thing to do anytime you're writing a function that hooks into core, go look at the function in core, go look at the action, see what it's actually doing, see what variables get passed, because sometimes they might add a third variable, a third optional variable that gets passed through, but the codex or whatever only shows the two because it had two of them for five years and now it has a third for two months. So. But you then go through, and that's like half the filters I've found, I've found because of that. Because you'll see where it gets filtered through before it gets outputted. Which means you can see where to pump in and do what you need to do. Uh, but yeah, core. Um, because there's some awesome, well-written code in core, and there's some horrible code written in core. And you can see both. Because there's some underlying stuff that's been there basically since the beginning that we can't get rid of because so much else is kind of running on top of it. But it's code that was written 15 years ago. And like, code that was written 15 weeks ago is questionable and if it's still current. So 15, you know, like, there, there's code in core older than my son. So, you know, I learn more from things that are done wrong than things that are done right. Because if it's done right, I don't know why. And if it breaks, I'm not gonna know why, and I'm not necessarily gonna know how to fix it. But show me something that's adequately written and then I can start to piece out the things that make sense to me and the things that are like, oh, maybe I'd do this differently. Or, you know, then, but from there, again, I wouldn't look at big complex ones because usually they're interacting with so many other parts of themselves that it's, it's self-referencing all the time. Um, look for those plugins that do one thing. Like, actually, go pull airplane mode. Um, it's, some of them, some of it's, you know, I, I had to find everywhere in core that it checks for updates because that's an external call. There's a lot. <laughs> It took me a year to find them all. And actually, some people that are here um, found two or three of them that I still couldn't find after a year. Like one of them pulled me aside at a work camp. He's like, check this out. And he was all hyped up on Mountain Dew. And um, it's just this horribly looking code. And he's like, there's all your update logic. And I went through and I took 10 minutes to make sure my tabs and spacing and everything was like, you know, periods at the end of my comments and all that. The code was just as good before I cleaned it up. So yeah, look for plugins that do one thing because then you can see why that code exists. Whereas if it's something like, say for example, Yoast SEO, I wouldn't even begin to look through that code unless I was debugging something because it does so much. Um, whereas a plugin that does one or two things, you can easily see cause and effect. And that's, and that's really how I learned. Like that's how I started in all of this stuff was I found plugins and themes, broke them, see what happened, built them again. Um, do you want to manage it? Um, I don't want to manage the server, is really what it comes down to. Um, because I don't do that, and nothing ever goes wrong on a, ser on a server when you have time to work on it. Um, so that's the thing where, like, I don't mind if somebody who knows what they're doing is using some of those a uh, AWS uh, configs. I'm not going to, because I don't really know what half of those things mean. And that's a job that people have. 
that means I don't do what I do now if I want to learn how that works. Because I don't like knowing how things kind of work. If I'm using it, I want to know enough about it that I can fix it. So certain stuff I just don't do because I'm like, I don't have the time to learn everything about this. Um, and especially if it doesn't work, I'm not going to know why. And especially if it's AWS, because it's almost a, half the time a black box of where it actually goes. Um, but there are hosts that do that. And they've, they've worked out those issues. Like I know Pagely does a lot of stuff on AWS. And um, like I work for Liquid Web, so it's obviously a, you know, I'm not going to say this host is good, bad, and different. Um, but like we're using Kubernetes on the uh, WooCommerce platform, which is a deployment and container tool. Like again, all those things are really rad. Um, but we have a team of people who do that for work. I'm one person who doesn't know how that works anyway. So yeah, I, 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 I get pros for that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so. I don't want to be developing, but I know, like, you know enough to start a business. Yeah, um, initially, you know, it's one of those things where I want to know enough about something that if I'm paying someone and they tell me something, I know if they're lying to me, basically. Um, so, uh, to get familiar, like, the PHP and WordPress is such that a lot of the modern, like, schooling tools are actually not going to be useful because it's going to show you how to do things that you can't do in WordPress due to the PHP our inability to get past five two. So um, from there is, you know, again, I reading code makes sense to me, which I know is weird um, and not normal, and I'm okay with that. But uh, look through, um, Tom McFarlane uh, writes a lot of good stuff, um, and he writes tutorials in a way that makes sense to people who are getting started. Like he actually takes the time to explain what some of these things are, like auto loaders and and singleton, you know, like certain PHP stuff, he'll explain it in regular English. And same with uh, Pippin Williamson, uh, Pippin's plugins. He's the one that built EDD and a bunch of other things. Uh, he's got a whole lot of tutorials. Like I still have two or three of his bookmark for localization because I never remember how to do it. Um, so both of his, both of those two sites have a lot of uh, tutorial and kind of walk through on individual parts of development that they're related to WordPress, but they're not always exclusively, which is nice. Some of it will it'll bleed more into regular PHP. That will kind of give you more of a basis of what you're working on. Um, so the media uploader by default only allows certain file types for security reasons. So usually it only allows pictures and maybe, I think PDFs are there by default though, um, but I remember I had to modify it to allow bitmap files and uh, SVGs at one point or some other file type that it didn't natively, or Excel files. It didn't by default let you upload Microsoft Excel files. It's a filter. It's a one-line filter in code, and it allows it. Um, later on, find me, and I'll look at your site, because that's a one-site thing that I can't. Yeah. Without looking at it, there's no way I can tell you what's wrong. So yeah, we can, we can look at that later. Um, so sorry, is the five minutes for everything? Oh, for lunch. Oh, wow. OK, cool. We filled the time. Um, so we got about five minutes. Is there anything, any other questions? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tom McFarlane. Tom McFarlane. His site. Um, and I think both, like Tom's is like TomMcFarlane.com or whatever. So, um, but he's a WordPress developer. He's a, uh, if you Google, you, you'll find it if you do a basic Google search. Um, he's the only Tom McFarlane in WordPress that I'm aware of. And the other one was Pippin? And Pippin. Yeah, Pippin Williamson. His site's Pippin's Plugins. He's built, you're using code that he's written. We'll put it that way. <laughs> um, so I think we got one, one, maybe two more. All right. Well, I had a question that I was going to ask myself if it never came up. Is the idea of ethics, because we're building things that people use in ways that we may not like. Um, like I don't like the fact that white supremacists use WordPress to push their bullshit, um, but I know that I've helped write that code. And however, I won't work with clients or people in general who, you know, 
may or may not agree with. Uh, and it's one thing to disagree with someone, it's another thing to like support what they're doing. Uh, we're gonna get to a point pretty soon where we have to actually figure that out because we're in tech in general, we're building tools that people use and we're never thinking about why. As engineers, we don't really care about what people do with the tools we build. I've run into that problem. Um, it used to be cool because it's like, oh, you're using a plugin in a way I never imagined. That's really rad. Um, but now it turns into, oh, cool, you're using tools that I wrote to convince people that things aren't true. Uh, so, how do you control that? It's not a matter of control. And, and uh, that's the thing that like, we look at it as like an absolute, like we can't prevent it, so don't bother. It's like, by that rule, we won't have had any progress on anything ever. <laughs> so, um, you know, the idea of just like being mindful, if you're building something new, like, yeah, WordPress has existed for so long, there's no way that, you know, we can pull that back and, and all that. But anything you're working on, look at, immediately think of how somebody, I'll use a phrase here, and I, all right, there's no kids in the room. Um, there's a phrase called dick proofing. And it basically what it means is that if you run a site that has user-generated content or user-submitted content, you have to prevent, someone will send you a picture of a penis every single time. It's, yeah, I know, shake your head, because that's the proper response. However, there are other people that are like, mm, yeah, all right. Um, so you essentially have to build something into that tool to make sure that those things don't show up online. Yeah, anytime people are like, oh yeah, we want to have people submit pictures for a contest. I'm like, cool, who's moderating it? They're like, oh, we're not moderating it. I'm like, yeah, you are. <laughs> and then I'll show them a site that has unmoderated stuff and they'll be like, oh. <laughs> so we need to be more mindful about what we're building for other people and how it might be you. Like think of the worst case scenario of everything you ever build because someone will find that for you if you don't. But I believe we're out of time. Oh, we have one minute. Is there anything else that we want to fill in? Because I haven't gotten one ridiculous question yet. What's the most important thing you've learned in the last year? That the world doesn't owe me anything. Oh, we got time for a couple seconds. There we go. I'm sorry, what? At that point, it was about petty spite, so yes, absolutely. And I made sure he said, I made him mail me a dollar bill in an envelope. I already knew I was going to fire him at that point, so. Thank you. If you have anything particular, um, I'll be here. Feel free to ask. I'm glad to help, especially, you know, we can grab some. We're going to eat lunch. We'll do something. You know, I'm here all weekend.